Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Amy Woods, the Executive Director of Alumni Relations at Marist and a graduate from the class of 1997. We're very excited to present this webinar to you today featuring the Marist Poll with Dr. Lee Maringoff, Dr. Barbara Carvalho, and Jada Dapper on the topic and democracy the next four years. If you encounter any audio issues, you do have the option to dial in by telephone provided in the chat box. Due to the number of participants this evening, we have muted all lines except for the hosts and presenters. We're going to reserve the chat option for any technical questions you have or general questions for the Marist staff who are listening in. Please do not send private messages to Lee, Barbara, or Jay as they may not see them. Please use the <laughs> Q&A feature for questions that you have about the presentation and be sure to direct your questions to the host. There are several ways you can view this presentation on your screen. On a desktop or laptop, if you hover over the right corner of the video portion of your screen with your mouse, small icons should appear. The preferred choice for a webinar like this that does not include slides is stage view, was called active speaker view, now stage view. <laughs> on a mobile device, you should be able to swipe through to see uh, the different features. There will be a brief survey on your screen at the conclusion of the webinar. It should pop up as a new tab in your browser. If you have a minute, it would be extremely helpful to hear your feedback. And now I would like to introduce our host. Lee Maringoff is the director of the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion and an assistant professor of political science. He is a frequent commentator on politics and elections and is often quoted in print and digital media. Lee has appeared regularly on television and radio as an expert on public opinion, politics, and polling. Barbara Carvalho is the director of the Marist College Poll. She has written numerous articles on elections, politics, and public policy issues, and frequently comments on current events for print and electronic media. Jay Dedepper is the director of innovation at the Marist Poll. Jay worked for 22 years in television news, reporting from around the world for WABC and WNBC in New York. Jay's storytelling skills and innovative production led to dozens of awards, including the National Cronkite Award, a dozen Emmys, and scores of local citations. Together, Lee and Barbara direct the NBC of key electoral battleground states and the national NPR PBS NewsHour Marist Poll. Lee, Barb, and Jay, thank you for taking time to speak with us today. <laughs> thank you, Amy. Uh, and I was, we were teasing before the uh, before we went live that uh, Amy looks like she's right now the the next cover on the Marist uh, Alumni News there. So that I thought that was uh, we all, we all got to get one of them. But anyway, hi folks, hi everybody. I'm glad uh, glad you're gonna. Uh, I was going to say, glad you took some time out. We're all at home. I mean, where are we going to be right now? So, you know, we're all at home anyway. But what tonight we're going to do is, you know, we do a weekly podcast. Um, and we've actually, I think, done 180 of them, which strikes me as, I don't know, how many years that is, 50, 50, 50. It's, it's like we've done it for more than three years now. God, you think we get it down. Uh, Mary Griffith, who's listening somewhere out there in New York City, is uh, our executive producer. And then the three of us either talk about polling or to have a guest or so. And this today we kind of like to do this tonight a little bit like that. Um, I should just start things off by saying uh, two things. One, um, we uh, the last time life seemed sane at all was last winter when we went with a group of students to the New Hampshire primary and spent uh, oh, four or five days meeting with the candidates uh, and the press and, and, and it was like we had our old buses and all that. We had already done a national poll on, on the coronavirus. Uh, no one knew about it and no one cared. Uh, and then things suddenly changed. And I think between that and the campaigns uh, and then the, the second round of impeachment, I mean, things haven't gotten quiet since. Um, and we've been polling right along on lots of issues. And, Today, I thought I'd just broadly call this polling and democracy in the next four years. That's a little pedantic uh, uh, on my part because I, we're not even sure what the next four hours are going to do, uh, let alone the next um, next four years. But um, we are, uh, you know, actually tonight we are polling. We do all of our interviewing now remotely. 
Um, and uh, we're actually in the process of doing a national poll on our index and uh, asking some preliminary questions on uh, President Biden, uh, which is our first round kind of like benchmark stuff on him. So that's my way of saying hello. I'm glad you joined us and we're going to talk a little bit. And then I know there's some questions and then we'll have, have a little chit chat as we move along. So that's all I got to say. Jay, you were going to, you know, toss something out there, I think. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks for, for joining us, everybody. If you do listen to our podcast, we'll try not to do what we did this past week at our podcast, exactly the same thing. Um, but we are we do want to start off by talking about the most recent poll we did. We are, as Lee mentioned, in the field as we speak. Uh, people are dialing on phones right now uh, asking Americans questions uh, about the new president. But uh, about 10 days ago, we were in the field asking questions about the new president and the last president and coronavirus and a bunch of other things. And there was some very interesting data in that that I think is a good way to get started. And I just want to kind of talk about two of the data points and then we can go from there uh, because they, they talk about two different things that I think we're seeing. Uh, we have talked an awful lot about partisanship for the last well, at least four years uh, in, in our polls. And I think a lot of people in politics uh, have talked about the partisanship, um, increasing partisanship where Republicans answer a question one way, Democrats answer a question another way, and independents kind of, you know, are in the middle, as, as you might expect. But not just about politics. It's about almost everything in our national life. And so one of the numbers that we saw in this last poll was we asked a question about um, Joe Biden's um, uh, plan to ask Americans to wear a mask for the first 100 days of his administration. And when we asked that question, 74% of national adults said they supported that and 23% said they opposed. A strong number for something that has been, um, you know, a, a little bit less than universal uh, across the country, the support for that. But here's what I want to point to. While Democrats, 94% of Democrats said they supported it, 51% of Republicans said they supported that idea as opposed to 43% who opposed. Now, that's a big partisan gap, but it's not the kind of flip that we've been seeing where it's 80-20, 20-80. And so I think there's a hopeful note there, but then I'll also turn to the most, the least hopeful note of all in the poll. We have been asking a question um, for uh, 20 years, since ja uh, January 2001, um, right direction, wrong direction. Is the country headed in the right direction or the wrong direction? We have never, and we don't ask that question once every two years. We ask it like in almost every poll. We've asked it dozens and dozens and dozens of times since 2001. It has never been lower, the right direction number. 20% of Americans saying we're going in the right direction, 75% in the wrong direction. So good news, bad news. Uh, there's a lot of else in the poll. Where are we and what are we seeing in these polls about the national mood as we have this transition from the past administration to the new administration. Well, Lee Parb. Yeah, the poll. I mean, good evening, everybody, and uh, and uh, thanks for uh, spending your evening with us. Um, I, the poll we did, you know, last week, um, I think shows, you know, a couple things. I mean, you showed where we actually have some consensus in the country um, on mask wearing. Um, and also on the direction of the country uh, itself. I think there's a, a good deal of pessimism. Um, people point to, to a lot of different things, but top of mind for many Americans uh, is the pandemic and coronavirus. Um, and it's, it's translated not just in terms of health, um, but it's the economy, it's, it's getting kids back to school. Um, it's all the things that has changed what normal has been um, for almost a, a year now. Um, you pointed to our trip to New Hampshire, and that was just, um, we're almost a year uh, to the day for, uh, for that, just a couple weeks, just a, about a week away. Um, and so uh, it's, been, it's been a really um, significant change. But some things, um, I think one of the things that I saw in this poll, which I thought was interesting, which is still a partisan divide, you know, Democrats on one side, Republicans on the other. But I thought what was interesting was um, people's opinions of how President Biden um, is, is doing right now. And it's not that, um, you know, we use that always as a benchmark um, because, we, you know, we ask all the presidents right at the starting gate, you know, what people think of him. Um, and although he's, you know, just uh, around, um, 
you know, 50% in terms of uh, his favorable um, rating and um, about 55% of Americans think that he's going to uh, unite the country rather than divide it. Again, we do see uh, a partisan divide, but I think what is very interesting in those numbers is that we also see a very large double digit, uh, pushing almost one in five, um, unsure. In other words, people willing to say, you know, let's kind of wait and see. Um, and I think given all the kind of, you know, partisan rancor on, uh, on, on both sides, um, I think that is also uh, a hopeful sign. Yeah, I was, I was going to jump in on that and just say that, you know, one of the things that we're always just personally interested in is some kind of sense of a return to normal. Uh, that can be talking about COVID, it can be talking about our politics. And when we talk about the politics, well, first of all, the COVID, people don't think things are necessarily going to get back to normal anytime soon. Um, and I think as the vaccine becomes more, uh, more prevalent, more available, uh, those numbers are likely to change. Um, but when it comes to the politics, I mean, Donald Trump, unlike any other president, his approval rating never really moved dramatically from anywhere from low 40s to mid to upper 40s, depending on the polling organization. But four was the, the first digit on almost every poll until the last uh, week or so of his administration where he fell into the 30s um, after the uh, attack on the Capitol. Um, but so Donald Trump's administration was not normal in terms of the way public opinion, you know, you typically you get a honeymoon, you get a little you know, free time, first hundred days, then you have, you know, whatever your administration's about. Hopefully you don't get involved in an economic problem or an international conflict. Uh, and then you move on from there and different administrations end up, you know, in, in different shape in, in, in public opinion. But but right now we don't really know whether you know the Joe Biden numbers are going to go up, go down once they start going. Because as Donald Trump so accurately said when he was first running for office, and he, he talked about that example, if I went on Fifth Avenue and you know shot somebody, you know my supporters would still be um, behind me, uh, would be backing me, and in many ways his supporters have not really jumped ship to any significant degree. And even today during the day, uh, we just had a couple hours ago, the vote um, in the Senate uh, on whether the second impeachment should go ahead or whether it's unconstitutional to pursue. And the Republicans, 45 of them voted to stop the proceedings. Only five uh, voted to go ahead with the impeachment proceedings, um, which again shows this incredible reach that Donald Trump has within the Republican Party, still no longer being president, uh, but, you know, he has not left in the minds and hearts of, of the Senate, and that's because he hasn't left in the minds and hearts of Republican voters around the country, uh, which is where he's been all along. And that, to, to me, is, you know, we've had so many events, and not the least of which was on January 6th which was sort of like the most shocking event that I can recall in our politics. And um, and the numbers, you know, his number went down a little bit, but, you know, the Senate isn't reacting to to anything at all. So I'm just finding you know, the, the constancy of the Trump years um, and whether we're going to return back to something that looks more familiar in the, in the next couple I think two, two things on our numbers about Trump that, I, again, to set the table for the discussion tonight, and you just hit upon one, which is his approval, disapproval rate. Uh, in February of 2017, the first time we asked the question, as he was president, he'd be, you know, he'd begun, uh, be, he'd been inaugurated in January of 2017, 39% approved, 50% disapproved. His last number, January 15th, 2021, 38 approved, 57% disapproved. So his disapproved went up. His approval rating went from 39 to 38 over four years. The highest in any of our polls during that entire time, we asked practically every month, is 44%. That's as high as he got. The lowest he ever got, 37%. I mean, this guy didn't move. So I, I think that's a, a point well taken, and it's something to talk about. The other thing is uh, we asked the question about uh, best president, worst president. What do you think What do you think you're going to say about Donald Trump? And I, I, there's, I, you may 
be surprised, you may not be surprised. I wasn't terribly surprised that 47% of, of Americans said he would be one of the worst presidents in US history. All you gotta do is look at his disapproval number and how strongly people disapprove to see that you're gonna get a pretty high number. 16% um, said one of the best, but here's where I think there's a little surprise. Uh, among Republicans, 13% uh, said one of the worst presidents and 8% said below average. That's 21%, that's one in five Republicans saying to us, to pollsters, eh, not so good. So I think those things are bookends again to the Trump presidency and, and say a lot about um, how much, how little changed uh, and how much power he may have in the Republican party, but how lasting that may be. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that this is the lasting, um, the lasting thing where we're gonna be talking about the Trump influence, you know, in eight years from now or something but like what, that, even oh, four years you're talking in the midterms in 2022 uh, and whether Republican candidates are worried about being primary with people who might have the endorsement of Donald Trump, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wanted to add one little point to that. Uh, and the, this constancy of approval rating didn't start with Donald Trump. We actually saw it with Barack Obama uh, and during his term. Uh, it wasn't locked in like Trump's was, but it was sort of like mostly in the high 40s, doing better than Donald Trump, but it didn't really move much from high 40s to low 50s. In other words, we had the same kind of seven, eight point range, you know, when things were good, a little bit better, when things were not so good, a little bit lower. So that, that and I think that reflects the polarization and and just the divides and you know that we have uh, because not a lot of people are thinking about what they are reacting to in politics. They just are sort of they already you know it's like rooting for the Bills or the Chiefs. Did they play each other. Well, like I don't. I don't know. I don't know if I. I don't know if I totally agree. I mean, certainly you know we have our teams, we have our tribes, and it's been characterized in so many different ways. But if, if we look back at um, election day, um, I, I think people were, you know, voting also about what they thought the future of the country should be um, and in which direction the country should go. I mean, there's no question that the pandemic was top of mind for, for, for many, many people. Um, and it, um, and it, it, it really uh, drew from, you know, different, different emphasis, but still, a very large issue. Um, when we asked more recently um, about, well, what is it about, you know, coronavirus that, you know, should be the priority for the next president? Um, people talked about vaccinating everybody in the country. Um, people also talked about getting uh, dollars to small businesses to, to boost the economy, uh, payments to um, less so, but payments to individuals. Um, so I think that there's a, a real concern. There are some very big issues. Um, you know, we've been we've been looking at the at the you know presidents, and if we look across time of the crises that presidents have faced, um, I think that um, you know when we we kind of you know get into the midst of impeachment, when we get into the discussions of you know one side and the other, I think it really takes away from what is the task at hand? Um, and, and, and again, we start listening to the 10% on either extreme rather than the 80% who's in the middle who would really like this Senate to start voting um, either up or down on, on the issues of the day, would like this, you know, this president to focus on uh, the economy, on healthcare, on uh, the pandemic, um, to, and to moving the country forward. So, um, you know, I, I worry that we're going to get back into, you know, our camps and away from, um, I think, what got a lot of people to, to vote. We had records turnout in November. Sure, it was because Donald Trump uh, was, was on the ballot, uh, for better or worse, depending upon uh, your opinion. But we had tremendous turnout. We had tremendous participation. And I think it also speaks to uh, the significant issues that the country uh, faces. I think one of the numbers that we saw uh, last week too, which which can be a little startling. I mean, it's important that people do, most people do feel that we need to wear masks, but it is somewhat concerning that only six in 10 Americans 
uh, have confidence enough to want to take uh, the vaccine. Um, we did see in that particular poll that about 4% of Americans said that they had already gotten the vaccine and another 58% said that they would take it. But that's a, that's a long way. I mean, that's a long struggle uh, to get to a point where we are protected from either um, this virus or the mutations that are being discussed by scientists. So there's a lot on the table um, to do. And so I kind of, I can, I kind of worry that, um, you know, we kind of fall back into, um, you know, our, our camps and, and those debates when in fact there's so much consensus on a lot of issues. Although both, yeah. although both sides, uh, Democrats and Republicans in the Senate wanted to delay the actual beginning of the trial till the second week of February uh, for different reasons. But one of it is so we can deal with a little legislative action and not um, get away from that first hundred days of uh, and just get totally caught in the trial, which is obviously going to be totally divisive. Uh, it already is, and there's no reason why it would be anything uh, different than that. Um, I had thought, though, also that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of looking down the road and trying to figure out because the, the turnout was enormous, and that's that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but I think the Democrats are going to have to wrestle with. Um, Joe Biden, who's more to the center traditionally, um, but also the progressive wing uh, within the party. Uh, and he's going to, you know, in many ways, that's where the big turnout was from for him uh, and the energy. And he has to deal with that. I think we are seeing that already in terms of his cabinet picks. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it plays over in his legislative um, agenda. And then we've talked about the Republicans being somewhat divided between the you know, the institutional guys, the, the, the Mitt Romneys of the world, um, and then the Ted Cruz's and the Rubio's, and, and a lot of people are thinking of, you know, running for president uh, in four years, and and that energy within the, within the Congress especially, but also in the Senate. So in a sense, we almost have four political parties right now, uh, not two. I remember back, uh, oh my gosh, in the 70s, uh, uh, even before I was teaching at Maris, which was started in the mid seventies, um, but I remember that you know the political parties were very different, and you know the Democratic Party had liberals, moderates, and conservatives, and the Republican Party had liberal, moderates, and conservatives, less liberals. The Democrats had fewer conservatives, uh, but the parties were at least kind of like mixtures, and people were saying, "John, we could just have parties that you know stood for different things. We could get more clarity in our politics." Well, we now have two tribes, <laughs> maybe four, but certainly two. And sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for because uh, uh, it's turned yeah. out to be this kind of gridlock uh, that, that, that so many of us, you know, find displeasure. I, I think Barb's point's well taken though, which is how, how quickly we revert to what has become the norm, which is this this tribal warfare and, and strict, you know, strict partisanship. One thing, just to go back to our poll one last time, because it is about coronavirus and, and that really clearly is the dominant issue for everyone in America for good reason. But mm -hmm. we asked over the over the course of the pandemic, we asked um, when people thought daily life would return to normal, to a sense of normal. And when we asked that question back in May, there were a fair number of people who said, oh yeah, pretty quickly. Um, when we asked this just a couple of weeks ago, 25% um, said in six months, and it gets worse from there. 32% said in about a year, 22% said longer than that. If you do quick math on that, that's you know over 80% right there saying that it's gonna be six months or more. I wonder how that impacts this partisan war. That combined with the fact that um, Donald Trump, at least for now, isn't on social media, some of those voices are more muted. Is there a fatigue at all of it? Whether you whether you're hearing AOC, you know, with her Twitter feed or Trump with his Twitter feed, the fatigue on that and the fact that coronavirus is the main thing, is the main deal. And people thinking 80 percent of Americans think it's going to be at least six months before we get back to normal. I just wonder if that has uh, if you think that that has a may have a mitigating impact on us um, in large numbers reverting to our partisan corners and, and turning an opening fire, so to speak. Well, I just want to change the topic just a little bit. Um, you know, we've been uh, <laughs> talking about uh, lots and lots of poll numbers. 
And um, can we can we still believe the polls? <laughs> Is that a question? I, mean, I know answer? I know that everybody I know everybody here tonight believes the Maris poll. Yes, there's, absolutely. there's there's absolutely no question about that. But you know, polls have uh, had polls. You know, we've had um, polls have been in the middle of that uh, that partisan um, uh, discussion and debate as well. Um, are they still relevant? Well, you know, I'm, I'm probably the worst guy to ask that question too. But I'll I'll start it off, and then I know Donna. I, I think uh, you may go have an opinion about it. Yes, I definitely have an opinion. I mean, I think that polls provide a lot of things. That are very important information um, beyond just the who's ahead and who's behind. Although, you know, people say, "Oh, I, you know, there's too too much on who's ahead and who's behind." But if you put out a poll, first question any reporter will ask us is, "Well, who's ahead and who's behind? You know, by how much? Uh, and how are the battleground states going?" And of course, we wouldn't know what the battleground states are if we didn't have polls to tell us that those were the close states. Um, but I think, in terms of even the issues that we're talking about here. Uh, in terms of the economy, in terms of public opinion on the coronavirus, I mean, I think we're providing um, an independent public information source uh, of, of important information um, that uh, helps people arrive at a clear decision. So uh, the, the question you probably also are asking is, are polls trustworthy because of their accuracy? And I think that this was a very, very, very unique and difficult environment this time not the least of which was because we had people voting uh, by mail, we had people voting uh, early um, in person, and we had people voting on election day. And although we knew that those were the ingredients, we really didn't know what the recipe was gonna be. And so the polls sort of had to take a good hunch of best guess. Um, you like to say that science is messy, and when it comes to polling on elections, it's really you know difficult. And uh, made more so because of the situation we were in, just the environment for this particular presidential election. Well, the Maris poll certainly was successful, but there were a lot of lessons to be learned as well. Jay, you've been uh, you've been you've had the distinct pleasure of being both a journalist and a pollster. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's that's the yeah that's the reason I'm working here now is because uh, you guys were our pollsters when I was at NBC. So. Yeah. I spent a lot of time with you guys, you know, figuring out the questions we'd ask in various, or well, you did the questions, but I made suggestions, generally poor ones, uh, for questions <laughs> that we would ask. I think there's a lot of responsibility on on the media, um, and, and not to absolve uh, the polling industry of of of, of uh, any responsibility here. But two things that I would say, going back to 2016, the polls weren't wrong in 2016. It's a myth that has been perpetrated forever, and yeah. the national polls were right. Ours was right. Bunch of good polls. We're right. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. We, you can't poll the Electoral College. So that's just, let's put 2016 aside. This year, you know, Arizona, our poll in Arizona said it was a tie. Let me see now. Oh, yeah, Arizona was a tie. I mean, you know, Joe Biden won by 12,000 votes. You, you can't get a poll that's going to get any better than a tie on that. Other polls were more challenging. Um, but I think the problem is that Lee's right. As a reporter, if I get a poll, I'm not going to go. Oh, what now? What are people thinking about the economy? I, I'm not first thing. To, who's up? Who's down? Because that's what's got to be the lead in my story. And my story isn't about the poll. My story is about the state of the race or whatever it's about. And I'm taking a poll number to help you know, you know, with that narrative to help tell that story. So all I'm looking for, in many cases, all a reporter's looking for is who's up and who's down. And there's a lot of polls out there now, and a lot of them are very poor methodology. But as a reporter, and many reporters, they say, okay, well, let's just take an average. Well, if you're averaging a lot of crap and one good poll, the lot of crap is gonna weigh more. So I think there's a, the, the problem in the polling industry is actually less significant than the problem in the media in needing polling numbers to tell stories, but not doing a particularly great job of, of telling that story. And, and we have taken you know, some responsibility for that, but we've, all, we've also done something else. We, we started an online academy called the Academy. It's an online learning portal in which we uh, spent a lot of resources and time to create this um, six course you know, online academy that goes through these issues. And it's for the public, but it's also for journalists. 
uh, to learn more about how they're reporting. And what was so interesting to me when we did that uh, was that I had reported on polls for 25 years, or 22 years, as a journalist, a lot. I was a political reporter most of that time. So I reported on a lot of polls. And I will confess, I knew much less than I thought I did about polling. So we are doing our part on that in that way, and, and other polling organizations are as well. But I do think it's incumbent upon the political press, especially you know, for reporters to be uh, more careful in how they portray poll numbers and what they say about polls and say what they mean. Because they don't always mean what reporters say. They and, and they're not as precise as they might appear. Don, I understand that you have some questions that uh, you wanted to jump in on, uh, and uh, we should uh, do that as well. So, hi, Donna. Yeah, sure. I thought it would be relevant while you're talking about it. Um, so, let's see. The first question is, um, would you say that Trump has had a hold on the Republican Party or that most Republicans were afraid to step out against him? because he might slam them somehow on social media. And as Trump falls from power, will Republicans maybe feel a little bit to be themselves again? Hmm. Um, I, I, I'll, jump, I'll jump in on that one. Um, we've been, you know, we've been polling uh, President Trump um, for, for more than the four years through the primaries and we even polled him when he was, you know, uh, lived in New York. He had shown interest in running for uh, other offices, including a governor of the state and mayor. But I guess he figured he would uh, leapfrog all of those uh, kind of smaller executive positions and and go right to the top. Um, I think that uh, I think Trump uh, tapped in to some you know real issues uh, and real opinions. Um, and impressions um, in in the United States, and um, if you look at uh, Americans who consider themselves to be Republican, and even people who consider themselves to be independent but uh, lean Republican, um, they have very positive impressions of him. Not necessarily what he says and how he says it, uh, but they point to what they feel that he did uh, for the economy, what he did for judgeships, what he did on the Supreme Court. Um, so um, I can't get into the minds of, you know, the senators who do seem to um, very often, you know, move with the um, with the political wind. Um, but I think that there is, uh, you know, real support. Um, and there always was that very significant support uh, for for Trump. Um, and it was, you know, it was through many of his ups and downs. And I think until, um, and I think until this uh, past year, 2020, um, with the pandemic, where I think there were confusing messages um, about the intensity uh, and the seriousness of the pandemic. Um, I think that we, I think that we saw um, a president that was probably heading towards um, re-election uh, rather than one that was going to be turned away after after the uh, the votes were counted on election day. Um, so I, there's a there's very strong support for Trump in this country, um, and I suspect a number of senators probably ignore that you know at at their at their peril, particularly um, and I shouldn't say just the Senate because in Congress uh, understand that. Uh, you know, in 2010, during the last redistricting, um, the Republicans um, held power and majority in many of the state houses um, across the country. And so they thought it was a really, you know, great idea as, you know, Democrats had done in the past as well, but they thought it was a terrific idea to redistrict many districts so that those, those seats were secure. Um, and yes, it makes it easier to get elected but it also makes it more difficult if there are um, other other views um, in order though for those views to be to be heard um, because it, it makes it makes for what Lee was talking about instead of having uh, parties uh, Democrat and Republican that have liberal moderate and conservative voices 
um, we end up with very pure types, whether that's in a legislature or it, whether that's in a congressional district. Um, so I think that that's, that's, uh, that becomes, you know, part, part of the issue. But I think Trump has very strong support um, in the party. And the question is, you know, really where he goes uh, from here. Yeah, I, I, to, to put it uh, differently, uh, you know, the, the red states and red districts are getting redder and the blue states and blue districts are getting bluer. And that makes for a very dysfunctional legislature and one that's evenly, evenly uh, divided. Um, Barb, can you take 30 seconds out just to tell the story about how you were the first person to know that Donald Trump was going to run for president? Ah, yes. Well, uh, in 2015, uh, we were at the um, Washington Correspondents Association uh, dinner, and um, you're either uh, someone who is a, a gawker, as I am, or a gawky, which Trump, you know, <laughs> probably and, and, someone yeah. we would gawk at. And so um, I did go up to uh, his his table at that time. Um, I believe uh, Ivanka and uh, Jared uh, were there, although uh, not as recognizable as they certainly are now. Um, and, um, you know, introduced uh, myself and asked if uh, um, I could take a photo with him, um, which he, which he, uh, graciously agreed to. Uh, and then as Lee was fumbling with the camera, I figured I needed to make some chit chat and uh, introduce myself and explain that I was uh, from the Maris poll, which of course uh, he had heard of, had, you know, felt was an excellent- a fair poll. poll. That's a fair poll. Not only that, he, uh, he appreciated uh, and knew that we had polled on him in the past. And the only thing he was really upset about was that we had not included him um, in the primary matchups uh, for the Republican presidential primaries that were coming up in, uh, in six months. And uh, I simply explained to him that he had said that he might run for president uh, four years previous, but that he then didn't. And so until he announced, we weren't going to put him in our poll, at which point he then said, put me in your poll, I'm running for president. <laughs> And the rest was history, as we say. So I think a few weeks later, uh, he then did announce, and uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's uh, definitely nothing we did foresee when we were at the that dinner uh, uh, almost uh, six years ago. Yeah, long time, long time. So um, I don't know if Jay, you want to comment, or Don, if you have other questions, either way. I'm sorry. I, I can give you another question. Okay. Um, on, the, on the Twitter Jay, feed. Jay, I'm not hearing you. Uh, uh, you were talking, but you're, I'm not hearing you. But go ahead, John. There we go. Okay. Yep. You're good, Donna. Okay. On the Twitter feed during the election, there was an ongoing battle between Nate Silver and Elliot Morris about <laughs> methodology and interpretation. Did you follow this and was this healthy for the polling business? Oh, I love that question. Um, uh, it, it was, yeah, I was following it. We even we even got into the discussion at, at various points. I'm not sure, I, I don't really know how to answer that other than um, some of the, the pundit pollster types, you know, kind of get locked in to what their perspective is. And, uh, and they both are just, we're just slamming each other, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. Does it help? Does it hurt? I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, I, well, I, I mean, I, I, I just uh, first of all, I, I want to kind of differentiate between Nate Cohn, who actually does do polling, uh, and Elliot Morris, who just does some modeling. So, um, you know, part of this is just wanting to. Um, kind of get eyeballs. So it, it is to everyone's benefit to have these debates and get into these arguments um, in a very public way. And if you were following them, you could see that they got uh, pretty nasty um, at different at different points. Um, and I think that's that's part of uh, kind of what social media has done to our debate. Um, and so uh, we'll see. I mean, uh, I think Elliot Morris is, uh, has he taken some time off from Yes, he's got a book coming. He's writing a book. he has a book coming out on polling. And it'll be really interesting because um, not to get too in the polling weeds, but 
Um, there's really a debate in polling between um, an interest in, uh, in, well, an observation and saying, okay, our response rates are so low that there's no way that these polls are really random, that we have to quote, model what we know the population to be. And so Elliot Morris comes from a position where he feels that you don't really need all that many interviews and you don't need that many polls and you don't have to even worry about the quality of the polls because I guess he's smart enough to figure out how to quote model the electorate. Um, and if you were following his models, um, you know, <laughs> yes, he said Biden was going to win, um, but he didn't, I don't, I mean, I, it's just my opinion, I don't think he uh, touted us in any better direction um, than, than anyone else, although he claimed um, victory afterwards. Uh, Nate Cohn at the time, I think is, is more of a scientist. And the reason why I say that is because although he, he, he does a lot of experimentation, um, he uh, works with this Siena poll, which we, you know, we, we forgive him for. Um, <laughs> um, but there you he, go, that partisan <laughs> tribalism we we said is not good for oh, America. Hey, come on, come on. We, you know, we play we play Siena in in basketball, and we play them in Poland. So, yes. uh, so uh, it's it's okay. It's it's okay to, uh, to jump to shots. Paris. Jump shots versus snapshots. Yeah, I know. Exactly. That. So, but he but he's more of a scientist. He, he although he believes that modeling can you know be an important part of understanding an electorate. Um, he also understands that there is a science behind polling and he's grappling with trying to figure out different ways of sampling, different ways of approaching um, measurement um, and to try to find to find an answer. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think the, I mean, I guess the debate is somewhat healthy if you can kind of, you know, chop through the hyperbole um, and kind of the, um, you know, the, 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 the show of it, um, yeah. because I think a lot of it is also for show and eyeballs and getting, you know, getting attention and getting people to click through. Yeah, the, the guy I like to follow a lot is David Wasserman, who uh, works for the Cook Political Report on election nights. Um, he's great because he looks at all the numbers like everybody else and He's not afraid to jump in and say, as he puts it, I've seen enough, and he tells you who's going to win the state. And he was he's batting a hundred percent. So I, his, his name's David Wasserman. He's with the Cook Political Report in Washington. And as far as I know, he's, I haven't seen anybody better on the on the numbers of him. Yeah, and he know. I mean, he really knows pretty much every precinct in the country. Uh, he just has, uh, you know, an a, amazing uh, mind for those kinds of, of numbers, as well as the uh, scientific analysis. So that's a good recommendation uh, going forward, particularly if you're making your list for 2022. <laughs> you have to follow him for the uh, for the. And, 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 and kudos to uh, our friend Steve Kornacki, uh, who has come to Marist on several occasions, uh, and we've used his book, uh, The Red and the Blue, uh, for. Uh, uh, in class, and he's wonderful in, in, in teaching. He was remote last semester in class, um, but then he became such a, a important figure on NBC and MSNBC because of his khaki pants and his kind of unorthodox slide. Oh, phenomenal. You know when you've made it to Thursday night football and Sunday oh, night right. football. Sunday Just night made football. to Sunday night football. Sunday night football. Yeah. They got his little screen there and all that, but uh, kudos to him too. He's, he's terrific and very generous with his time. Is there another okay, question? Can I ask, I'll ask you guys another question since we sure. were just talking about uh, Twitter. Um, are the views expressed on the Twitter accounts of the Marist poll team representative of MIPO and Marist College? Well, I would... uh, well it, de it depends which Twitter feeds you mean. Yeah. If, you mean the Marist oh, poll, the... if you mean the Marist poll Twitter feed yes, um, yes. and our Facebook, um, uh, absolutely. Um, I think individually, though, when um, we um, when we um, you know when we tweet, um, obviously um, you know those. I believe all of our Twitter feeds say that it is our own opinion. 
um, and it, we're not speaking, um, you know, for Marist or for our roles um, as, uh, you know, at the at the Marist poll. Yeah, I, mean, I would just say that, uh, you know, it, it's such a, you know, we're in such a supercharged environment. Um, you know, when we, uh, you know, develop our staff, you know, we don't ask their political views, obviously, and people are entitled to <laughs> have very views. We do require people, though, to vote for whoever's ahead in the Marist poll. Oh, stop it, <laughs> Because we want to make sure the <laughs> poll is right. That's the important thing. <laughs> I, I know, you know, I know we all have, you know, high, you know, uh, personal efficacy, but that's really pushing it. <laughs> I, think that, I mean, I think like most organizations, um, uh, I think there are probably, you know, some uh, kind of unspoken, um, you know, boundaries, but um, I think that there is also um, the need, uh, you know, for perspective. Um, and the ability to have that perspective on, on social media. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you got more yeah, on there? Yeah, I have some, I have another question. Oh, good. Is it becoming more difficult to find politically neutral language to use in polling and survey questions? Oh Boy, my these God. Are, that's these, are, these are tough statement. questions. That's an understatement. <laughs> and I, I think, and I think I'm doing too much talking, but if you guys want to jump in, but no, you, know, you, you really you're, struggle. you're the question lady, so you should uh, answer this. We really, <laughs> we really struggled. And I think that, I think that <laughs> the hardest part for us, um, the hardest time, because we always, uh, we always work to make sure that, um, we present two sides in a question. We always joke, um, there's the survey question, you know, do you feel such and such? or not. And it's not really a great survey <laughs> question. It gives you two choices, but it, it explains one and it doesn't explain the other. So we work very hard to try to ask questions um, that pose um, sides. But this, this election cycle, and I'm thinking particularly after the election, what was really, really hard is because we, we have a different set of facts mm -hmm. Um, we have a different language that we listen to um, from our media sources. Um, I think we were we were very careful in asking post-election questions um, and making sure that we were taking into account both perspectives. Understand that every time there's an election, there's a very large proportion of people who feel that somehow uh, the election wasn't fair. Um, in fact, uh, in 2020, uh, we we did a we did a poll that said 63% um, of Americans felt that the election was fair. Obviously, meaning there's you know uh, a third More of third. Americans who felt it wasn't. In 2016, uh, when Trump won and Hillary Clinton lost, um, only 57% of Americans thought that the election was fair and that you know trump was the legitimate president um i i don't think it's I, I don't think it's novel for us to to question um you know to question results and to question what happens and questioning is good i think it's when we move to um you know cynicism when we move to um not believing um those people particularly the election workers i'm thinking you know, I'm thinking of the election workers in Pennsylvania and Georgia and Arizona who who worked, you know, really through the night and for days, um, legitimately counting um, those votes. Um, I, I think that's when we start getting into, you know, issues of, you know, institutional distrust, which is which is very damaging. But so, yes, sh short answer is we we pay very close attention to what the arguments are on both sides, what the language yeah. is on both sides. You know, we're not perfect, um, but we are very conscious. Well, of a good example of that is we were very aware of obviously President Trump was contesting the election. And the question we actually had raised with amongst ourselves, although a lot of the media was referring to Joe Biden as president elect, we knew in a questionnaire context, if we were calling him president elect Biden, 
we were annoying uh, at least a third of the people we were talking to. Well, so, we were we were also taking a side. Yes, we were taking a side, and and so yeah. we don't want to take a side when we're asking when we're asking for opinions. Yeah. We don't want to. We don't want to seem like we're taking a side. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we're, like I said, we're not always successful, but um, you know, we were very, we were very uh, cognizant um, of that, particularly, uh, you know, between election day and uh, inauguration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think we have time for just a couple more questions, right? Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Is politics local anymore, or is it simply a function of partisanship, negative partisanship turnout? Uh, it's it's a good question. You want to go in there? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, so Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the House, is, was famously, you know, quoted as saying, "All politics is local." Uh, and I, 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 I do think um, from the time I started covering politics, which would have been when Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House, uh, to you know, the to the Obama term, that politics became less local. I don't know, historically, there may be other times, I'm not a historian, so there may be other times in US history where there have been periods where politics was much more national and much less about, you know, who's the guy who cleans your, who's the guy who, and there were always guys who got the streets cleaned, you know, uh, back in the day. I, I do think that politics has become less local um, and has become, as it has become more partisan, has become more nationalized. Um, that being said, there are examples in uh, in every state, well, maybe not every state, but there are a lot of examples of Democrats in the South, which is not Democratic anymore, and not not the guys who've been Democrats since 1960. You know, new Democrats. Andy Beshear in, in Kentucky is an example, and there's others, attorney generals in some states. Um, where people are, uh, I, you've got to believe they're, voc they're voting on local uh, issues, or at least statewide issues, uh, because everybody else they vote for is a Republican, uh, and, it, and vice versa. There are, are Republicans in Democratic states. I mean, all you got to do is look around the Northeast. The governor of Vermont, the governor of Vermont governor is Republican. The governor of Massachusetts yeah. is Republican. The, I mean, you know, the list goes on. Um, so I do think it's become uh, less local in the aggregate, uh, but I do think there's still lots of examples where people um, go to the polls and they will split tickets. We saw that this time uh, and voting for the person that they think is best to handle the job that they are being hired to do, be it the attorney general, the governor, the mayor, uh, whatever that is. Well, the, um, although at the presidential and Senate level, uh, there is a, a shrinking of split ticket. You know, the person who carries the state for um, president, typically those senators win also. Uh, Except it's not, didn't, right, but <laughs> this last time. time there was, this time there was, that was a big change this time. That's what I'm yeah, saying is, is yeah. that was, that was a trend that has been reversed. And I don't think that we know where it's going from here. I mean, is 2022-2010 redux? Or is 2022-2002 redux? Or is it going to be all new? We don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's too yeah. early. I don't want to talk about 2022. <laughs> <laughs> I knew when 2020 came around, I was going to feel old. So when I was younger, I, I didn't. Uh, so I, I'm going to pretend that it's you know still maybe... 2000 or something like that. Don, I think you had one more, but it, <laughs> that I want to just say, uh, because, you know, you know, Barb and Mary and Jay and I and the other folks at the poll, you know, we get to play pollsters on TV and all that. But, you know, right now we have 324 of our students who are doing the interviewing. And my guess is that some of the folks in the audience, you know, maybe even have did the exit poll in the late 70s, uh, where we sent you to far corners of Dutchess County with maps that were not drawn to scale. Um, They've never forgiven you for that. <laughs> but so we do want to take that uh, as we, we are that when, when we're talking to this group, you know, clearly we're the home team. So we, we do want to thank you for that, uh, that work that you've done, because that is that those are the folks who talk to the people. But anyway, Donna, why don't you do that? Okay. Two, two more quick questions. I think we can have squeeze things in. How does the poll account for the proportion of the electorate who refuse to participate in the polls because, they, because they're integrated into the mass media bias? Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I'll 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 jump in. Um, okay, so I'm going to be a little counter on this one too because um, I don't really. I mean, yes, there are uh, individuals who do not participate in polls, um, but I don't think that's the issue actually with the polls, and that gets at what I was kind of referring to about the difference between trying to um, model your numbers and trying to actually uh, get an accurate measurement, which is what we're trying to do. Um, yes, response rates have uh, plummeted um, in polling, um, but part of it is, and I know this sounds really weird, but it's actually how we count response rates. So every time we dial a number, whether it's a real number or not a real number, um, it gets counted about, you know, whether we've contacted a person or not. So as we've exploded in the number of numbers that we that actually exist, um, response rates would certainly plummet because it's a proportion of that. That said, it, we still have a very difficult time getting a hold of people. Um, but the issues I think you've been seeing with the polls is not that a particular group of people are not participating. I think that that Although that may occur, it's not the problem. Um, the problem is that uh, it's actually a geographic problem rather than a demographic problem. So it's where they live um, rather than who they are. And there have been a lot of changes to telephone polling in particular because of, of cell phones and those wonderful robocalls that even pollsters get and despise. Uh, but as part of that, we've had to we've had a lot of changes in regulations in how we can actually dial a cell phone number, making it incredibly expensive and time consuming to do it correctly. Um, in order to pr improve productivity, meaning in order to improve the the number um, numbers we have to dial before we get a person, um, and to lower the costs. Um, Samples have been um, added to, <laughs> for <laughs> lack of a better way of describing it, which means information has been added to those to those numbers. Information like whether you have a cell phone um, that has an address attached to it, um, whether it's um, a cell phone that has been in a cost center. Um, which means you've paid for it for a number of years, because that means it's likely to be a cell phone that's attached to a person as opposed to a number uh, that's a cell phone number that's part of a throwaway phone. So um, in, in the attempts to make our samples more productive, uh, what happens is we end up uh, oversampling or calling more people in areas that have a lot of people. What does that mean? They're more urban. Even if I'm looking at a rural county like Dutchess County, um, I'm more likely to get my numbers disproportionately, not in terms of population, but disproportionately from places like uh, Poughkeepsie or Beacon, rather, you know, than um, you know Clinton Corners or Red Hook. Um, and it's it's simply because we uh, many. We try to improve the productivity and lower the cost. So the phone numbers are matched to information, economic information, um, uh, reading, you know, information, news information. Um, and that has simply um, caused us to poll rural areas less and urban areas or clustered populations more. And I know that's a really technical answer um, to your question, but even when we heard the last time around in 2016, well, if a poll didn't wait by education, we should throw that poll out because uh, pollsters were undercounting people who didn't have a college degree. Well, a person with a college degree in a rural area was still more likely to vote for President Trump than a person with a college degree in an urban area. So it wasn't so much about their college degree, although that was partly a factor, but it was it was also very significantly 
um, partly because of where they live. And um, so yeah, I was thinking, Barb, as you were talking, I was also thinking that um, part of the urban, rural, suburban issues became more uh, exposed when the suburbs became a little more Democratic or Biden esque or Hillary Clinton esque. And the overcount then in the metro area between the big city and the suburbs reinforced the era rather than right. the rural part. So, in a sense, that, 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 Trump that changed. Did, it. Trump mobilized, I mean, Trump mobilized people who lived in more remote and more rural areas. And so it just exacerbated, um, you know, that that problem. And it wasn't it was something we hadn't we hadn't seen. I mean, we had accounted for it in 2016. We tried to account for it in a greater degree um, in, um, in 2020. But in 2020, um, there was all the issue which we refer to as we actually had three very separate and distinct electorates. We had a mail in electorate. We had an early vote in person electorate, and we had an election day um, electorate, and they all looked completely different in terms of partisanship. So, Thank you. cool question. Thank you. These are great. I hope, I hope you survived. These are terrific questions. Uh, <laughs> that degree you have from Marist really uh, pays off. Let me tell you, these are great questions. Well, we want to thank you so much, but one final question before we let you go okay. for the evening. Um, does your team have any projects in the works right now? And what's next? Yeah, I'll tell you one that we're doing that's a lot of fun. We, we It's called um, College to Career. And um, we started this during uh, the pandemic because we wanted people to feel more connected. And so it's a remote internship uh, at the Marist Pool, either in data resources or in more media, uh, communication information. Um, and we've had students from all different majors, and we're hoping maybe even this summer to do it as part of the pre-college program at Marist uh, and get some high school kids, uh, because high school kids of today make students of tomorrow at college. We like that concept. But uh, I don't know, Barb, anything else on the table? Well, um, you know, we're going to continue uh, developing, you know, our remote process. Um, we are likely to be doing polling in a variety of uh, different ways. Um, we will still always maintain um, our uh, phone calling uh, process, cell phones and landlines, but also uh, we will be looking to uh, tech, be, te be texting um, and be doing some more online polls um, as, we, uh, as we work with students and teach students all the different methods of, of research and also how to uh, understand um you know what what we do in all the different parts of what what we do and jay you you're the director of innovation you got anything to uh to add to that i got nothing oh, <laughs> it's all <on>. secret <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm like the black ops department i can't tell anybody i tell you guys that's it but <laughs> well, we actually but then you'd have no, to kill us I mean, all huh I'd have to kill everybody. No, I mean, very briefly, uh, this is a, a historic time for, for polling as it is a historic time for any uh, business. As, as we, whatever happens on the other side of this pandemic, whatever we get through the pandemic, uh, the work world will not be the same. This is one of these paradigm shifts that are, that will be noted by historians. Uh, part of that is remote work, but part of it is the ability to use technology in entirely different ways. One quick example, uh, the focus group is something marketing companies and political, uh, you know, uh, politicians have used for years to get be, get far past the do you like them, do you not like them, why and why you can't ask in a in a poll very well uh, and get those answers in, in any meaningful way that really gets you the depth. In a focus group, you can. Focus groups are historically very expensive, difficult to do. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons why they're done, but they're not something that you do very often. Uh, we've been doing focus groups, as have others, um, with this technology, WebEx, Zoom, and uh, finding some really interesting ways to engage with people who might not have engaged in personal ones where they had to get in a car and drive to a center and eat Snickers bars out of a bowl and talk to people. Uh, <laughs> it's a different world when they can sit in their in their living rooms, uh, in their you know, nightgowns in some cases, as we've seen. Um, and so I think that's one one place where we're making some strides in using technology to change the game, to change the, the, the kind of data we're getting and what we're gonna do with it. 
early stages, early days of this. We did some of it during 2020, but I think that's one of the most exciting um, kind of long range things that we're looking at doing. How did I know you had enough, you had something? <laughs> I mean, do you, you know my list. We just had the stand of the meeting on this today. It's a long <laughs> list. So, well, we look forward to seeing what you have in the future, and we hope that we can work with you again and do something else in the upcoming months. So, and in consideration of everyone's time, I'm going to wrap it up now. I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening and keeping Marist Alumni Office in your life during this time. I'd also like to give a big thank you to Lee, Barb, and Jay for spending time with us and sharing your expertise on this topic. A full recording of this presentation will be available in a few days on the virtual opportunities page on the Marist Alumni site. We've posted the links in the chat box on your screen. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us and have a wonderful rest of the day, evening, wherever, wherever you are. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great night. Bye-bye. Thank thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.